Welcome to module four of this year's entitled Emerging Treatments for Early Alzheimer's Disease, Mechanisms of Action. My name is Dr. Mark Gronin. I'm a geriatric psychiatrist and work as the Senior Vice President for Behavioral Health at Miami Jewish Health in Miami, Florida. I'm also the Chief Medical Officer for Mind Institute at Miami Jewish Health, which is a memory disorder center. Uh, I'm joined here again with my friend and colleague, Dr. Richard Isaacson. He's the Director of the Alzheimer's Prevention Clinic and an Associate Professor of Neurology. He's also an Assistant Dean in Faculty Development at Weill Cornell Medicine and New York Presbyterian in New York City. So Dr. Isaacson, welcome again to the program. Great. Thanks, Mark. Really appreciate you having me. Absolutely. Uh, just in terms of faculty disclosures, I do some consulting work for Biogen and Eli Lilly, and Dr. Isaacson does not have any specific disclosures for this program. Uh, it is provided by the North American Center for Continuing Medical Education, an HMP company, and supported by an educational grant from Biogen. Uh, in terms of our learning objectives for this module, we will summarize treatment targets for emerging medications for early Alzheimer's disease, and we'll compare the disease-modifying effects of mechanisms of action of currently approved Alzheimer's disease medications with the mechanism of action of emerging Alzheimer's disease medications. So as we talked about in our last module, the current FDA-approved therapies only improve symptoms in Alzheimer's disease. So we have the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, which block the enzyme acetylcholinesterase, thus increasing the synaptic availability of acetylcholine. We also have the NMDA or glutamate receptor antagonist memantine. This reduces excess glutamate activity, which appears, which, which is damaging to neurons. So these have limits. And the key thing here is that we need an effective way not only to improve symptoms, which we can do, but how can we actually slow the disease process? So the pathology of Alzheimer's disease is characterized by the deposition or the, the really progression of, of, of deposits of amyloid. And this is really known as the amyloid hypothesis. And stage one of the amyloid hypothesis is uh, really important because the amyloid precursor protein or APP is cleaved or cut uh, by beta secretase and then gamma secretase into something called a beta or a beta fragments. And including there's a toxic subform of these fragments. And this is called a beta 42. And the a beta 42 is really kind of the, the, the holy grail when it comes to trying to treat a patient based on the amyloid hypothesis. You know, the main problem here is that that fragment is insoluble and it begins to float on its own throughout the brain. It clumps together in what are called beta pleated sheets. And then these also clump together further and form really the core of what's called a neuritic plaque. It serves essentially as a foreign body in the brain. And so your, your immune system in your brain, your micro, microglial cells recognize this as essentially a foreign body. It, it, it's not, it's insoluble. And so you begin to get this inflammatory response centered around this neuritic plaque core. So stage three of the amyloid hypothesis includes this inflammatory response and, and destruction of neurons or brain cells by these toxic A-beta-42 plaques. So you have these neuritic plaques they are composed of insoluble clumps of A-beta-42, the dying and dead neurons and neurites and neuronal fragments and these products of microglial activation, they all build up. And this is really a target that we can focus on for uh, disease modification. So during this pathologic process, uh, the build of amyloid is seen almost like, a, almost like a trigger, and it begins to set in motion a destabilization of tau protein. Now, tau protein is a, uh, basically a stabilizing component of the microtubules in the cell, basically the skeleton, the cytoskeleton, the cytoskeleton of the neuron. And so what happens is that as you get excess phosphorus onto these tau proteins, they begin to destabilize and fall off the microtubules and the entire integrity of the cell begins to fall apart. So in stage two of the tau hypothesis, it's, it's important because without this tau protein, the microtubules destabilize while tau forms these insoluble filaments in the neuronal body. And that really leads to impaired exonal transport. Um, and these hyperphosphorylated tau, uh, they, they form these, these, you know, clumps and, and these clumps 
they form neurofibrillary tangles and these cause the neurons to collapse. So as you can see, the pathology builds up and it really impacts and affects brain cells and it causes them to die. So as we took you through that, those diagrams, you should be able to begin thinking about, well, if you can interrupt any point along this, would that make a difference? And so for instance, if you look at all the different experimental approaches, they're, they're at some stage along that process. So some approaches are trying to prevent or reduce in the beginning the formation or buildup of beta amyloid or tau protein in the brain. Um, think about those enzymes that turn the normal amyloid precursor protein into the toxic form. Can you inhibit those enzymes? And that's been a attempt that unfortunately does not work. Can you disrupt the aggregation of beta amyloid protein into those beta pleated sheets and into the plaques? Or if you can't stop it from building up, can you use either active or passive immunotherapy to basically target beta amyloid or tau and get rid of it, either by uh, injecting someone with a whole peptide or part of it to trigger an immune response or giving someone the, the antibodies, which we'll talk about as the main approach. Or finally, even if you can't slow that down, can you somehow enhance cerebral metabolism uh, by either let's say giving ketones or by boosting insulin receptors or some way to try to circumvent all the damage from the buildup of these proteins by insulating or boosting brain function. When it comes specifically to anti-amyloid immunotherapy, there's several antibodies that have been developed uh, from over a decade ago, almost 15 years or so ago, bapinuzumab, uh, solinuzumab, gantanuramab, cronuzumab, band 2401 and aducanumab. Uh, there's several, it's a little bit of a word salad sometimes, uh, but they all are really important to understand because they each have differences. Um, and the differences may truly be um, really the, the whole nature about why these agents may work or why some of these agents may have failed in the past. Um, early studies also when using these agents didn't require an amyloid PET scan. And, and if you, you take, a, take a step back for a second and you say, okay, we're treating people with Alzheimer's disease with anti-amyloid agents, expecting them to improve. And I think in one study, it was up to 40% of people in the study ended up not even having amyloid in the brain. So as our you know, prog progression and our, our evolution of our understanding of Alzheimer's has come about, our ability to use biomarkers to, to truly diagnose pathologically um, consistent uh, states of dementia due to Alzheimer's disease um, are there. And that's why, you know, these drugs may have failed in, in the beginning. Um, that being said, though, not um, all the drugs may have been also used at the right dose. They may not have been given at the right frequency. So um, I think what we're learning is from our past failures, um, we understand how to set up future trials. And I think that can set us up for much more greater success. When it comes to immunotherapy studies, some involve monthly or, or some involve bimonthly infusions or even sub-Q injections. Uh, participants then can be followed with PET scans, MRI scans to assess for any potential side effects and neuropsychological testing. And then you choose an endpoint, you choose your primary and secondary outcomes. And, and this is how we can you know, best evaluate in a rigorous randomized controlled trial, whether the anti-amyloid immunotherapies work and whether they truly cause disease modification. Yeah, that's really been the most active area of research now, and we're getting closer. We'll talk about actually having a therapy here. Uh, in addition, we can focus on tau because we know that's the other, the, the other major component of this process. And similar with amyloid, there's a lot of different areas in which we can intervene. So uh, can, we, can we reduce the, that triggering uh, from amyloid beta-mediated neurotoxicity that appears to really drive this destabilization of tau? Uh, or we cut down on neuroinflammation. And we also know that there's some protein kinases which are involved in that hyperphosphorylation. Can we cut down on that? Or once this abnormal tau is formed, can we keep the microtubules from falling apart, which really destabilizes cell? Can we keep tau from aggregating? Because at the end of the line, you get tremendous amount of neurotoxicity. In fact, the belief is that this, the tau buildup is what may, may be the most damaging to cells that really drives clinical symptoms. If we can interrupt any stage along this way, that would make a difference. Now, uh, we're entering a period where there's more tau immunotherapy, but a lot of the other approaches here have not really yielded benefit at this point. But again, we're, we're learning. So thank you for listening to this module. 
please complete the post-activity questions. And we invite you to join us for module five of the series entitled Emerging Treatments for Early Alzheimer's Disease, Efficacy and Safety Data.